Dr. Glickson, <coughs> Dr. Bühlenfellner, ladies and gentlemen. It's my real uh, pleasure and honor to present on behalf of the fire and ice investigators the secondary analysis of the fire and ice uh, trial. These are my disclosures. Now the primary endpoint results of the fire and ice uh, trial were recently presented at the late breaker at the American College of Cardiology and were simultaneously published uh, in the New England Journal. The fire and ice uh, trial had a time to event endpoint for both the primary efficacy but also safety endpoint and was a non-inferiority trial to prove that cryoballoon ablation is non-inferior to what is called the golden standard for so many years, which is the radiofrequency point-to-point -point ablation. Now, in this study, we had uh, three predefined secondary endpoints, which were cardiovascular rehospitalization, including rehospitalizations for AQ fibrillation, repeat ablation, and quality of life. Now, in addition, we felt as investigators that we also should analyze all cause rehospitalizations and direct current cardioversions during follow-up. The inclusion criteria of patients into the fire and ice uh, trial uh, are very similar to most of the FDA IDE trials, patients with paroxysmal AQ fibrillation and prior failure of an antiarrhythmic drug and the exclusion criteria were mainly due to cardiac underlying disease. Now, as you can see, there was an extensive follow-up of all of these patients with weekly uh, documentations of tele-ECGs, and the patients were also asked to deliver a tele-ECG whenever he was symptomatic throughout the entire trial. Now, in addition to office visits, we also had quality of life assessments as uh, at baseline six months, 12 months, and every six months thereafter. Now the investigators participating in the fire and eye trial had to have documented experience in either technology, which means at least they had to have done 50 cases with cryoballoon or irrigated radiofrequency technologies we advised the investigators to only use a PVI approach in the study. The quality of life was assessed every six months, as mentioned before, using the SF12 and the EQ5D3L assessment. And I should also like to mention that the definition of rehospitalization in this study was a prolonged stay of equal or more than two nights post index procedure or inpatient stay not concurrent with the index procedure of more than one calendar day. I would like to thank uh, the uh, investigators but also the members of our committees, in particular the chairman of the Independent Endpoint Review Committee, Dr. Lewalter, and the chairman of the Independent da Data Safety Monitoring Board, Professor Valens. Now let's come to the results. Now the fire and ice trial, ladies and gentlemen, is the largest randomized trial in catheter ablation of AT fibrillation which has been performed so far. We enrolled 769 patients, 384 to the fire arm, which is the radio frequency arm, and 378 to the ice arm, which <clears throat> is the freezing arm. Now for all of our analysis, we have used the modified intention to treat, and the modified intention to treat group means these are all patients that have been randomized and treated within the study. Now, as you, com uh, as you can see, if we move from the ITT modified group to the S treated uh, group, we added one patient in the firearm. This was due to the fact that five patients that were randomized to cryoplation finally were treated with radiofrequency, and on the other side there were four patients that were randomized to radiofrequency that were not treated with the study catheter. So for the 
on treatment analysis, 377 versus 369 patients were available. There were no differences in the demographic data of uh, both patient arms, as you can see, but it is important to mention that almost 40% of the patients enrolled in the trial were females, which makes the data very, very generalizable for male and female patient populations. And what I would also like to mention, because I will come back to this, that almost 25, which is one quarter of the patient, had previous DC cardioversions. Now, if we analyze all cause rehospitalizations, you can see there was a significant uh, difference in favor of cryoballoon uh, ablation for all cause rehospitalizations over time. In the cryo group, there were 210 events in 122 subjects, which made a percentage of 32.6%, uh, whereas in the radiofrequency group, there were 267 events in 156 subjects, 41%, and the difference was 21% in uh, relation between cryo and radiofrequency patients. The same was true for events, cardiovascular rehospitalizations. Again, there was a significant difference in favor of cryoballoon ablation as compared to radiofrequency ablation. In the cryo group, there were 139 events in 89 subjects, 23.8%, whereas in the radiofrequency arm, there were 203 events in 135 subjects, 35.9% and there was a relative difference of 33% between the two groups. Now, as with the primary endpoint, an analysis was performed to assess the consistency of the treatment effect in pre-specified subgroups, with treatment effect being risk of cardiovascular rehospitalization. The results are displayed in this forest plot. The plot displays point estimates of hazard ratios and in co the corresponding confidence intervals for each of the subgroups. The central black line uh, indicates that there is no difference with <clears throat> moving to the left side, there is a difference in favor of cryoballoon, and to the right side, there would be a difference in favor of radiofrequency. Now, as you can see, most of the uh, point estimates uh, are changed to the left side, indicating that for all of these variables, there is um, um, a significant difference in favor of uh, cryoballoon. Now, that difference was actually significant for two parameters, which was the chats vas score, with a larger difference in the group of patients uh, with the chats vas between zero and one, and less of a difference in the chats vas group two to five, and there was also a significant difference in the patients with a prior history of uh, direct cardioversions. And as you can see, this history was again larger when the patient had a history of uh, cardioversions as compared to the group of patients without uh, cardioversions. Now to explore the prior history of direct cardioversions uh, further, the next slide displays the Kaplan-Meier plots for this uh, subgroup. As I mentioned before, around 23% of the patient had a prior history of DC cardioversions at baseline. The solid lines display the freedom from cardiovascular hospitalization in the no prior DC cardioversion group, and the dotted lines indicate the patients without the history uh, uh, of uh, DC cardioversions in the prior history of the patients. The blue curves represent the cryo arm and the red curves represent the radiofrequency arm. Now, as you can see, both blue curves are above the red curves with a larger difference in the patient with a prior history of DC cardioversions, the lower curve here for the radiofrequency arm and the upper curve here for the cryoballoon arm. Now, if you look to 
direct current cardioversions during follow-up, again, there was a significant benefit of cryoballoon ablation as compared to radiofrequency ablation with 13 events in 12 patients, 3.2% in the cryo group, and uh, 28 events in 24 subject, 6.4% in the radiofrequency group. Again, this difference was uh, highly significant and uh, it made uh, a total difference of 50% uh, in favor of cryoballoon ablation. And finally, if you look to the incidence of repeat ablation during follow-up in the fire and ice trial, again, there was a significant uh, benefit in favor of cryoballoon ablation with respect to, to radiofrequency ablation. There were 49 events in 44 subjects in the cryo arm, 11.8% versus 70 events in 66 subjects, 17.6%. And this difference was 33%. Now the last analysis um, that we did for this presentation was to look in quality of life issues. Again, as you can see, the blue curves represent patients that were treated with cryo technology and the red curves, uh, patients that were treated with radiofrequency technology. Now, there was no significant difference between the two treatment arms. However, there was a significant increase and improvement of quality of life from baseline to six months, and this positive effect for both groups was maintained throughout the 30 months of follow-up. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in the Fire and Ice trial, subjects who were treated with cryoballoon as compared to radiofrequency had significantly fewer events with respect to cardiovascular rehospitalizations, which included atrial fibrillation rehospitalizations, which actually turned out to be 64% of all cardiovascular rehospitalizations. Finally, there was also significantly fewer repeat ablations during follow-up, fewer all-cause rehospitalizations and direct current cardioversions. Now, both patient populations demonstrated improved quality of life scores after an ablation procedure. So, in summary, we believe that the secondary analysis of the fire and ice trial favors cryoballoon ablation over radiofrequency ablation as done in the fire and ice trial with important implications on daily clinical practice. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Karl Heinz. Uh, questions? Dr. Uh, John Kalman, Melbourne. Thanks, uh, Karl Heinz. I, I just, I guess, two questions. One, you know, sort of practical questions about your clinical um, implications. You know, I guess at present, over 50 percent of the EP world. Uh, is probably using point-by-point point RF and uh, you know many of us have been doing it for many years know what our own results are and very comfortable with that procedure and very comfortable with our outcomes etc you know do you think these uh, results suggest that we should change the approach that's the first part of the question the second part of the question I guess is even in training you know is if we go down this path you know, how do you think, who's going to be the workforce dealing with that increasing burden of complex atrial arrhythmias that, you know, that require that understanding for three-dimensional mapping and, and uh, what have you? So I, I just, I guess, draw you out on the uh, implications. Yeah, first of all, I truly believe that the investigators who did participate in the fire and ice trial were highly experienced radiofrequency users. I mean, almost half of the patients were done in Hamburg and Frankfurt, and the Frankfurt people were trained in Hamburg. So, and they were extensively trained in Hamburg. So there, there is, if there is a bias in the trial, the bias is in favor of radiofrequency. Because the people were really the, the best trained people in the world of radiofrequency ablation. I mean, the lab does 2,000 ablations, and 90% of the ablations over time over time, over the last years, were done with radio frequency. So for me, it's very clear that even in the hands of the very best people, and it's indicated by the results, I think the results speak for itself. We had, uh, we had a result, the primary endpoint result was 64, 65% freedom 
And it indicates that our hypothesis, which was 70 percent, was almost met precisely. So I think that at this point in time, doing a multi-center radio frequency-based trial, you cannot do better than was done. That is my, my perfect feeling. Now, if that is the case, that a multi-center trial, and if you look to all the other trials, even to the thermocool trial, the results were not better. Only if you look to the subgroup analysis of people that were in that certain 80% range of the 80% target, then the results look better, but it's a retrospective analysis. So we don't have better randomized multicenter data. So I think this is, if we take the rate of frequency as the golden standard, this is the best you can achieve. Now the surprise is that, that the cryo balloon with less experience across the world shows precisely a similar, a similar result. And the trial was powered to show non-inferiority and this endpoint was met. Now time to event is the primary endpoint. Does time to event to the first event tell us the whole story for the patients? It does not because the AT fibrillation burden is an additional and very important factor. It's not only to prevent the first episode, even if you accept the first episode to come to the same point in time, it is important whether there is a second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth episode. And all these parameters that we looked into here indicate to us indirectly that there is a significant benefit for the AT fibrillation burden over time in patients treated with cryo versus radio frequency. And again, I would like to mention that the overall people participating in the trial were born to do radio frequency procedures. So are you, their character, personality, everything. So in was, Hamburg, was are you, are you dropping RF ablation, Carl? That, Carl Heinz, that's the question. You Say know, it again. In, in Hamburg, are you dropping RF uh, ablation point by point? Um, you know, as, as a primary procedure for your no, paroxysmal this is AF population. Today, today is what? The 10th of June? I don't know. So this is the first time that I present these data. So I couldn't discuss it with the group. But now we'll take this data, which I actually published in the European Heart Journal. We'll take this data, we'll discuss it. And, and I can tell you, I truly believe it will change our strategies in Hamburg. And there is one additional point that I didn't mention here, but was published in the paper. You know, there is, if you look into time of procedure, a 20 minutes benefit in favor of cryoplation, even if you do a bonus application. Now today we're not doing a bonus application anymore. It's a single application of three minutes. Now if you add this to each of the four veins, you save another 20 minutes, which means that you get the same result less AFib burden over time with a procedure duration that is 40 minutes shorter in the best hands of the radio frequency world. I say this again, 40 minutes shorter, which means we can add another patient to our program every day and can treat more than the 4% of, A of AFib patients that are treated at this point in time with AT fibrillation. So there is a clear yes. So, but again, I, you know, I just repeat my question. You, you put up there the implications on clinical practice and you, know, you, you say you haven't discussed it yet, but the question is to you and what you think those implications are I think for the field is. because they're you know, you're you know, I, I truly advocating believe, a dramatic change, I guess. I truly believe, I'm always saying this, I said it five years ago, I didn't have the data. Now I have the data. And if I look into the future for the next five years, I do believe in five years from now, there is no point-to-point -point ablation to isolate the pulmonary veins. Everything will be done with the balloon technology. I'm not saying that everything will be done with the cryo balloon technology, but I truly believe that everything, that PVI will be done with the balloon technology. I have no question about this. It's practical, it's shorter, easy to learn, and there is no reason to continue to do a procedure, and, and we didn't talk about the safety profile because not, that was not part of the secondary analysis, it was part of the primary analysis, and there is no question. In the final ICE trial, 800 patients almost randomized. 
the rate of barcal tamponade in the choir arm was 0.3%. The rate of barcal tamponade in the very experienced hands of radiofrequency guys was 1.3%. And this was not statistically significant, but clinically, I do believe it's relevant. It's very relevant. And that is true for also for follow-up arrhythmias and so forth. So there is a lot of arguments. And here we are talking, uh, you know, to people like yourself, who is a highly experienced radiofrequency user. So we, but we should also talk to the people who are uh, average physicians, who are not highly experienced in one technology. You, you are one of the best trained guys in the world. So why should you change from your perspective? But if you talk to people that uh, are not that experienced, and even as I uh, told you, in the hands of very experienced radio frequency user, the follow-up is significantly better. The clinical benefit, the relative event reduction is in the range of 25 to up to 50 percent. That's a lot. We are not talking about uh, a reduction in events. And there's a clear trend towards all the secondary endpoints that we have taken. So there is nothing going forward and back. It's one, one trend and, and it's highly significant and it's one direction and the direction is named in favor of cryoballoon. We have time for another two questions. Thank you very much for this wonderful representation and this important data. There is uh, one thing that um, I did not understand. It was the, the, the couple of Maya curves that separate after more than 400 days. No? So if you go back to the, I think the cardioversion slide as well as this slide, yeah, if you go to the next slide, no? there, uh, so the um, repeat ablation, there must happen, something must happen after more than 400 days. Why do you think the curves only separate after more than 400 days? You know, if you look, <coughs> if you look at this, here we have <coughs> each of the events in the cryo-balloon group and also in the radio frequency group. So as you can see, there are early events, early events and they cluster around here, so there is obviously no significant effect over time, and then you see some effect um, over time with clearly less events in the late phase, in the later phase, uh, in the cryo balloon group than in the radio frequency group. Now, we have counted all, all the events here, and they are plotted all here. And uh, as you can see here, of course, there are events in the early phase probably due or maybe due still to recovery from the first uh, ablation procedure. So what I, what I think, again, it's, it's just a hypothesis at this point in time, that probably here over time there is uh, less progression in the cryo-balloon group than in the radio frequency group, and it could have something to do, first of all, that the lesion formation is different, as you perfectly know. We have very sharp, clear-cut lesions using uh, the cryo-balloon as compared to the radio frequency balloon. The lesions are, uh, the radio frequency point-to-point, -point, the lesions are totally different. Um, leading to less gaps and therefore to less recurrences of atrial cardias, and that is shown also in the trial that we have less recurrences of atrial cardias uh, in the cryo arm as compared to the radio frequency arm. So I think it definitely, to my understanding, has something to do with lesion formation, the lesion setup, and, and secondary, there is evidence now from fibrosis data, delayed enhancement from the MRI that the, the area of isolation is significantly bigger with the 28 millimeter balloon than it's with the point-to-point -point ablation. So the point-to-point -point ablation in, in the hand of most groups is closer to the veins and not as far outside uh, in the antrum area as uh, done with the 28 millimeter balloon. So I think there is some evidence, you know, some evidence. Again, it's, it's uh, the first time that a study was powered to uh, show any, anything. So un until now, the direct comparison between the two technologies were just limited to very few cases. Thank you. Last question, please. Thank you for your nice uh, presentation. Is there a specific reason to use American guidelines in definition of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in this study? In the light of the study results in paroxysmal AF patients, uh, according to European guidelines definitions, uh, is it uh, logical to uh, expose the results uh, in persistent AF patients due to the inclusion of uh, one-fourth one uh, cardioverted patients? That's a good, it's a good question. You know, why, why, are patients, why are patients doing worse 
that had a previous cardioversion if they are treated as radiofrequency in comparison to the cryo balloon. Again, I do believe it refers uh, to the same answer that I was giving to Dr. Tills. You know, I do think if you have a cardioversion in your history, you probably have a more diseased left atrium than if you don't have a cardioversion in your history. And again, I think the lesion set that we are producing with the cryo balloon is taking better care with a larger lesion, with a more sharp lesion, is taking better care of more advanced stages of patients with, uh, with um, atrial fibrillation than, than the radiofrequency procedure. And I think that is nicely indicated also by the STIF trial. Whatever you add to these patients except for an isolation of the pulmonary vein doesn't help. Of course, we need a powered study in persistent atrial fibrillation, but um, I can promise you that study will come. Thank you. Quick, quick one. I'm extremely grateful for you giving me a bit of time. Um, can I preface what I'm about to say by saying that this is absolutely amazing work? Uh, and I, um, but just to have a comment to make about the statement that you make that suggests that your ability to perform RF, your very good ability to perform RF, is actually fixed and you can't get any better. And the reason I'm going to say, say this is um, our approach to air fibrillation, my training, was you're on a spot, whatever a spot actually means, for about 30 seconds. The, there is no proof that 30 seconds RF on a spot, whatever a spot actually means, however you want to define a 3D point in space when a patient's heart is beating and the, they've got a varying amount of respiration motion throughout a case if they're under sedation, a consistent amount of respiration motion if they're not under GA, you know, if, if under GA instead. Um, and so I, I would suggest to you respectfully that you're, if you use education tools, learning tools during RF ablation in a certain way, if you're currently performing RF ablation and using 40 minutes of RF, you can halve that and get better results. Um, I have proof of that, uh, which isn't yet published, but I just suggest that you can achieve those outcomes. You know, I mean, I, I must be stupid if I would say that we cannot do better. I mean, you know, uh, if I compare what we did a couple of years ago and what we're doing today, of course, we are continuously advancing. But if you do a randomized trial, you have at one point in time to take a decision. Now, I mean, that is the history of randomized trials, that always uh, at the end of the randomized trials, somebody is standing up and saying, hmm, you could have done better. And that is true because, of course, the technology has improved and has advanced. But that is the limitation of a randomized trial. You have to stick to a protocol. You cannot continuously change the protocol. We allowed, at least in the trial, always to use the latest technology. But you have to accept limitations. But if we don't accept limitations, we will never ever do a randomized trial. And that's why I'm pushing randomized trials as much as I can. It's better to do a limited randomized trial than to do no randomized trial. Thank you. Thank you very much.